Um, maybe beginning. Yeah, we. I'll just have you kick us right off. Um, I'll call them in and then get chat. Okay, extra credit. Hey. Well, that's yeah, I know it's not. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I had a dream about our this last night, something about like the IRB people coming and finding us to talk to us and like it's just who knows, right? Your dreams are so I'm going to go ahead and get things started today. In fact, uh, Kelly is going to be talking to us for the first couple of minutes of class. And we're going to be offering you a, an opportunity to replace your low homework score. So should you get in and engage in the opportunity that Kelly is about to announce, um, at the end of the semester, I will go in and replace your low homework score. So that is the offer on the table. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, so most of you guys know me from lab, probably the afternoon folks. If you haven't, you might see me around or see me in class. Um, and so for my master's, I am looking at um, active learning and kind of what it goes along with it in terms of um, what level of science literacy do we have, environmental literacy, and then what kind of motivations feelings of inclusion we have um, as students in the classroom. And so really trying to get a feel for which active learning practices work best and for who. And so it's really a chance for all of you guys to give your feedback. Um, I know most of us are a little bit older now in the university, but things will start to change hopefully. So um, while you may not get direct impact of this, uh, definitely indirect as uh, classroom starts to change. So uh, just a few facts about it. It's online. It's a module. So it's a, just an online survey. I don't imagine it taking more than 15 or 20 minutes for anybody. Uh, with that said, it may be a little long, so there's no time limit. You can leave it up and come back to it. Um, it shouldn't require much brain power at all. You could do it on slow sleep even. Uh, just It requires honesty. So, um, and it is the preliminary study. So if you see any errors or any issues with it, there are places for responses. And please just be open and honest. Say this is way too long, or you covered this twice, or I really liked this section, anything like that. And my information is all on there. And so by participating, uh, you'll participate again at the end of the semester, and then we'll link it to um, your grade and let's see how, you know, Everyone that loves active learning gets age or something like that will look for some of those um, relationships. And but will not be linked to you by name, just by class, right? So it's going to be themes that we see within the class and how 
one theme of something that maybe you enjoy seems to correlate with something in your grades, but not individual grades, class grades as a whole. Yeah, anonymous. It's on Wyo Courses, and it is the last module on Wyo Courses. So if you've got your phone on you, you can hop on there even right now. It's scanned down in the modules, and it's the very last module. And it just says something like uh, active learning inclusion survey, and it's very obvious. Um, you can click on that and take it at your leisure, but we would really like you to try to get it done sometime probably this week, by the end of the week, because we'll do it again at the end so that we can see pre and post. So if you do both, then I'll go in and replace your low homework score at the end of the semester. Um, that's your incentive. Of course, if you choose not to do it, there's no uh, negative in doing that. Um, and in fact, if for some reason you're really opposed to doing it, you can let me know and I'll find another extra credit opportunity for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah so that's a, that's a great question. Kelly was in um, your genetics class, right? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, do it once. Choose a class and do it once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd hate to have you sitting in there doing it twice and yeah, once is fine. Once is fine. But if you could email me and just let me know that you did it in another class then I can give you extra credit. You know, I can give you the opportunity for the replace score. Yeah, yep, yep. Thank you guys for your time. Yeah. If you have more questions. Perfect. So I know everybody is getting um, jazzed about showing me your sexy mind tomorrow. So tomorrow we will be doing the exam. I know it's super confusing. Um, and a couple of emails have come in asking me about this. Yes, we do have lab. And yes, you do meet me in the lab to take your exam. The way that it works is that either me or Kelly or one of the TAs will be there in the lab. You'll walk in and you'll find us and we'll grab an exam and we'll take you to another room for that exam, a place where you will have quiet, uninterrupted time to take your exam. So just know that despite the fact that lab is going on in 5030, as per usual, you will have a nice uninterrupted place to take your exam. Okay, so that's how that all works out. Again, 7.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. I'd like you to start by 7.30 p.m. so that you can wrap things up by 9.30 p.m. Um, open, you know, for you to stay all day. I don't care how long you stay. Um, I do like you to do it in one setting unless we have otherwise arranged. And unless we have otherwise arranged, I would like for you to try to get it done sometime tomorrow. Any questions at all on the logistics of how that's going to go down? Hopefully it's a little bit clearer now. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so you will want to take your um, test at a time other than you, the time that you have lab. So if you're in the 8 to 10 lab, you don't want to take your test from 8 to 10. You'll want to schedule to take it some other time or choose some other time in your day. Maybe come at 7.30 p.m. or something like that. Okay. Nice, wonderful. So um, there are just a few other things that I wanted to mention. Those of you who are participating in Follow Your Gut, please try to summarize your contributions by the end of this week. Now what I will look for on that is basically your critical thought in posting good, reflective, informed uh, posts. So now when I go back to that, or Callie, Callie may be doing some of that, we're going to look with a rubric for your critical thought. We're going to come back around to you and say, here are elements that you can work on. We don't expect anyone to have perfect critical thought at the very beginning of the follow your gut discussion. But if by the end, your critical thought is super radtastic, then you're going to earn your full 30 points on that assignment. So try to make at least, um, of course, you've got your initial post, which is the one where you posted questions. But then try to make at least one or two other posts that show that you're thinking about answering some of 
those questions. And maybe you've called on some outside resource to help you do that. Maybe you've called on the lecture that Christopher gave to help answer a question that at the beginning you didn't know the answer to. Maybe you've called on lecture, something that I've said in lecture, to help you answer one of those questions. So does it make sense how you'll finish up your participation on there? And don't worry about being absolutely, you know, like, I, I don't, I'm going to give you feedback on, you know, on this first discussion, and then we'll have two more. So you have more time to discuss even more cool stuff. So Adam? Yeah, it would be easier. I missed um, Adam's questions, getting them. Re so the reason that I had you email them to me early is because the shell wasn't open yet. And so I miss getting his questions from email onto the shell. A lot of you, like I know Colin and Daphne and some of you emailed me like really early on and I moved them from my email into the shell early on. If for some reason I missed that, put your questions onto the shell. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So I think that is most of the lecture related announcements. Everyone knows about the Graham Stain report that's due on Thursday. Um, also, we will be doing a, a math intensive lab tomorrow. So we are going to be asking you to call on some of that old knowledge um, of how to do dilutions. So you may want to quickly review that, be certain that you're kind of ready for that. Um, I see Bailey back there going, oh God, dilutions, I forgot already. Just remembering that equation C1V1 equals C2V2, okay? So wonderful, that'll be on the up and coming for lab. Um, and I'll see you tomorrow to talk to you a little bit more about other things that will be happening in the lab. Okay, so from here, we need to talk about structures external to the cell. So I just had this like realization that I left my models in the um, room next door. So I'm just wondering if somebody in the back row, is it James, right? Do you want to run like into the coffee room? You'll see Norbert in there and, and like a cute little stuffed microbe. Could you grab him for me? Thank you. So what if Norbert has like external layers to the cell? For example, what if it lays down thick layers of polysaccharide, um, a thick, thick coat? For example, what is one, one thick coat that might be outside of the cell? capsules, right? Remember staining Klebsiella pneumoniae and getting a nice picture, hopefully like this on your cell phone, showing this thick outer coat around Klebsiella. A capsule is one great example of a thick outer structure. It's in a larger category called a glycocalyx. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're awesome. So now if we're thinking about Norbert, we can see them. So glycocalyces come in two types. And really, the term glycocalyx is just a sexy-minded term for thick outer polysaccharide coat, something that would be external to the cell itself. And in fact, if we were to add a capsule on here, and I was thinking somebody should make me a model of that where we could um, wrap Norbert up in this really thick layer of polysaccharide uh, capsule. So a capsule can be one of the types of glycocalyces. Another type is a slime layer. A slime layer is not near as well formed as is a capsule. It's more diffuse, more irregular. But nonetheless, a slime layer offers protection. Most of the time, a slime layer is only observed in vivo. What does that mean, in vivo? Say it again. Living, okay, good. Um, in the cell, while it is living, while it is undergoing its, its kind of typical processes, and with a pathogen, in vivo might very well be where? In us, good. So we would see, say, Staphylococcus forming a capsule, or excuse me, forming a slime layer in vivo. Now, slime layers, hard to observe on the microscope. Capsules, much more easily observed on the microscope. Now, who remembers what is one... Um, one function of a capsule. What's one thing that a capsule does for the bacterium that has it? Good, excellent. So Sophia is remembering that it prevents desiccation. We called it a hydration pack. Essentially, it's like having a camel back. Um, the cell all the time has access to water because, of course, carbs are very, very water loving. They get all filled with water, and that prevents desiccation. What else does it prevent? 
Yeah, good, Corinne. So it prevents phagocytosis. It stops the cell from getting engulfed and degraded by a white blood cell or by an amoeboid predator. It also allows cells to stick to surfaces, causing what? Our dentist will say. Potentially, eventually cavities, but first plaque, right? So that nice layer of, of, um, of a plaque that comes from Streptococcus mutant. So let's talk next about another kind of synonymous structure in function, but not in um, form. So that is to say that an S layer is made of something different than polysaccharide. Rather than being made up of carbohydrate, it is made up of protein or glycoprotein, which gives it a little bit different look. Instead of looking like sort of this more amorphous layer, it has a really distinctive floor tile-like pattern. So if you're to look at like floor tiles, we don't have any good ones in here, but right outside the door, that's a good example of what an S layer would look like, where you've actually got either square or hexagonal kinds of subunits formed by proteins usually, or glycoprotein. Wait, what's a glycoprotein? Protein plus sugar, good, or carb, right? Good, good. So we recognize this as being comprised of a different macromolecule. So a regularly and distinctively structured layer of protein or glycoprotein. And I thought that I was trying to pick on people this morning and think about who would be really super interested in this. Um, Daphne, you kind of mentioned a little bit of interest in biotechnology type stuff might interest you to know that S layers are used a lot in biotech. Um, they make amazingly regular biomimetic membranes because they're tiny little regular pores um, in between the floor tile like pattern of the, the S layer. And so they can literally make exceedingly small membrane pores, like pore sizes in membranes using these. So they're very, very common in biotech um, to exploit, if you will, the function of an S layer for that purpose. But the S layer for a bacterium does the same things as the capsule did, protecting against extremes in the environment, protecting against pH fluctuations, osmotic stress, enzymes, and of course pred predators, whether they be amoeboid or whether they be predaceous bacteria. We're gonna talk later about an incredible killer called Della Vibrio. Della Vibrio winds itself up, gets its flagella rotating at like a thousand revolutions per second, and bores into prey bacteria. It actually hits them so hard that it moves them, and then it gets inside of them and it eats them from the inside out. So if I'm a bacterium in the neighborhood of Della Vibrio, I so want an S layer because it's gonna to help to prevent that boring in that it does to get in and wedge itself um, into the prey cell. So S layers also help maintain shape, rigidity, promote cell adhesion, just like the capsule did. Um, and of course, to protect against phagocytosis. The last um, external layer that I wanna talk about is called a sheath. When I think about sheaths, I think about having like a clear straw and bacteria kind of packed in side by side by side by side in this straw structure. And it forms a community of cells. And oftentimes at one end of the straw, it sticks to some surface. So picture that, you've got this like straw-like structure with a community of bacterial cells sort of extending up. Maybe it's stuck to like a rock surface and then the community extends up all in this straw-like structure. What environment would that be super helpful? Yeah, good, aqueous environment, like say a river. Think about that, talk about fast food, right? Here you are, you're in this community, in this sheath, we call that, and you've got the river flowing by, it's like fast food's coming to you all the time. It's just coming by on a platter and you can grab it from the moving environment around you. So it's a really nice way to live in a community of cells. So the sheath, a tube, like a straw that holds a chain of cells. So I hope that this figure helps you differentiate the three types of external layers that we've now talked about, right? We've talked about a slime layer, mostly in vivo, capsules, which we, we stained for in the lab, right? Both of these are called glycocalyses and they're polysaccharides. 
Now that contrasts with an S layer because an S layer is made up of protein, glycoprotein, not carbohydrate. So it's a different macromolecule. Hit me, Bailey. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. So what if you were like a super armored bacterium? I mean, set for anything. Um, could you envision an encapsulated bacterium within a sheath? It's a wonderful question. And I'm going to say tentatively that probably is a thing. But I would love if you wanted to look up. And if anybody who has a phone on them, that you could just look and look up. Yeah, maybe you do, Bailey. Um, go ahead and look up sheath encapsulated bacteria. Because I can picture an incredibly um, resourceful aquatic bacterium maybe having both of those things and even causing a, a kind of nice community formation due to the um, polysaccharides of the capsule within the sheath. Um, it's a great, great question. A sheath is, is primarily made of a polysaccharide polypeptide, and th but then it also has some really interesting uh, things in it, like, um, like manganese oxides, you know, kind of metal oxides in it, that uh, it's cool to think about because, in fact, bacteria sometimes play a role in things as weird as the manganese cycle. So it's, it's, a, it's a unique structure, a really cool, unique structure. Let us know when you get any kind of answer on that, but I think that's a great, great question. So did you get this, that it's uh, in a tube or a straw that surrounds and holds a linear chain of cells together? I think a cool model to build, and I know um, Greg emailed me this morning, right? And you've got a model all built of gram positive and gram negative. I saw you. I know I saw you. <laughs> yeah, there you are. Um, and, and so if anybody ever wanted to make a model of a sheath bacterium, I tried to make one. It's kind of ugly. So it, I'd love to have a better one. Um, again, models that are, are, you know, withstand stress, <laughs> especially fitting for a sheath, will always warrant extra credit. Hit me. Um, so for the layers of cells, yeah. are all, cell, all bacterial cells going to have those layers? Right. Great question, right, right. Does everything, you know, somehow protect itself with one of these layers? No, no. Yeah, and, and so you can see why having a capsule or having a slime layer might cause the bacterium to be what? In your body, more pathogenic, how come? Better suited to interact with the environment and stick with it. Sure. Yeah, that's a great answer. There'd be another one too, because so Colin said it's better suited to like sticking to a surface in the environment colonizing. We could say it would be better suited to colonizing your body. Uh, what else would be true of it? It would be defended, you know, so white blood cells would have a harder time engulfing and degrading it. Your immune system would have a harder time finding, you know, recognizable, recognizable surface receptors like, like immunogenic compounds, like, for example, an encapsulated bacteria might not show as much what? What might trigger your immune system that might be hidden? Lipopolysaccharides, good, what else? Tychoic, lipotychoic acids, good, good. Yeah, we're reviewing. <laughs> I'm Bailey's still reading. <laughs> yeah, if they do have multiple layers, what's the order? Well, Bailey's still checking on whether we see that. But if, say, we thought we, we uh, the example that we thought we might see, it would be a capsule first and then a sheath on the external side. You know, that would be the more outer layer. But again, we're going to check on whether that's really too much of a thing. Now, um, um, it, there's bad news and good news. The bad news is that Norbert has officially lost his flagellum. I cannot find it anywhere. It's always falling out. And so the good news is that what I've decided is that flagellum was always horrible anyway. So really, uh, Norbert needs a new flagellum. Because remember that flagellum that Norbert had didn't really move. And so we would like to replace Norbert's flagellum with one that does move. So be thinking about whether you are a um, crafty person. Uh, maybe you've got some drills at home. Maybe you have a way to insert a nice filamentous flagellum here that's going to have all the parts of the flagellum that I'm going to talk about. And then I'll send Norbert home with you for extra credit. Kirsten, yeah.
Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. The enzyme, lysozyme, who remembers what that does? Breaks down the bonds in, now between nam and nag, in what structure? Peptidoglycan, right? Okay, cool. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So it wouldn't necessarily preclude lysozyme. It might make it harder for lysozyme to get to the nam and nag linkages, but it wouldn't necessarily preclude it. Um, part of that, of course, depends upon whether the um, enzyme is water soluble, right? Globular, and, and it is. So that does that make sense? Why that would matter? Cool. So let's talk about the structure of a flagellum. And first off, by the way, is this a flagellum of a gram positive or a gram negative cell? Yes, we have zoomed in super close on this gram negative cell, and we can see the ultrastructure of this flagellum. This flagellum, because it is adhered to the cell wall via something called a hook, has only two available motions to it. I want you to think about what those two available motions are, okay? So let's just jot down that this is a, a long, hair-like protein structure. We know that it's responsible for allowing movement. It uses the PMF as the energy source. Periplasmic space, excellent, good. So now we've got, say, this proton gradient in the periplasmic space of this cell. It can then rush in and cause the flagellum to spin. It spins like a propeller, and what are the two available motions? Clockwise and counterclockwise, right? That's the only way it can move. So are you picturing how you might rig up Norbert, a new flagellum that could spin either clockwise or counterclockwise and be visible. Um, and so we have some important parts here um, of the flagellum that I'm going to point out in a minute. But I want to make note of just how fast bacteria can go. So Vibrio alginolyticus, one of the fastest spinning propeller motions, goes 1,000 revolutions per second. Now that compares to E. coli, if an E. coli is motile, it's more like 270 revolutions per second. But let's put that into context, because I know, Aaron, where are you, like to run, right? And um, if, and we're, we're not gonna put you on, like, where's Aaron? Who likes to run? There she is. Um, so not to put you on the spot, but how fast do you usually run? Yeah, so like maybe when you're out training eight minute miles or something like that, right? Which is great, that's great training pace. That's even pretty fast actually, right? And so she's moving along at eight minute miles. If she were Vibrio alginolyticus, she would be moving at 62 miles per hour and running less than one minute miles. Yeah, that's how fast these bacteria are. But don't worry, Erin, because as it turns out, uh, they have a disadvantage that you don't have. And that is that they cannot sense facially. They can only sense temporally. What does that mean? Temporal versus spatial. Time versus space. Okay, so Erin's out running and she's like, okay, I just put down my eight miles. I am so getting an ice cream. So you can spatially sense over there is the ice cream. I'm going to run directly to the ice cream, right? But a bacterium couldn't do that. A bacterium would take this incredibly convoluted path to get to the ice cream because it would have to go like this. Ice cream is closer. Okay. Oh, yet closer again, right? And it would move in that way, sensing via time rather than space. So it's a little disadvantaged as compared to Erin in that way. So let's look at the parts or the components of this flagellum. And I'm going to uh, write on here and show you the different components. Oh, boy. Too many things going on in my life. My mom just was diagnosed with breast cancer, so we've got chemotherapy today. Um, OK, so let's actually write on here, possibly. Maybe. Ah, work with me, baby. 
So we're going to label the portions of a bacterial flagellum, noting that down here, this whole region that's inserted into the, into the membrane, notice that it's inserted in both the outer membrane and the inner membrane, right, spanning the entire uh, cell wall of this gram-negative bacterium. So this is going to be... what we would term the basal body. So this whole basal area is the basal body inserts into the cell wall. This is the hook. This is the filament. And the filament is made up of protein that coils in such a way that has a hollow core, which is a place where bacteria differ from archaea because archaea don't have a hollow core in their filament. So there are little differences between bacteria and archaea here. Filament in bacteria is made up of a, a protein that you wouldn't be surprised to know is called flagellin. So the protein that repeats in subunits throughout in a kind of coiled way to, to make this helical structure with a hollow core is called flagellin. So there are some other structures here that are also important. We have the rings called the L ring, the P ring right here. Hey, what is the P ring kind of insert in? In the peptidolycan, yeah, it does. And then um, this ring here is the MS ring. And then the bottom one is termed the C ring. And it's been of utter, utter devastation to me because they used to be called the S and M rings. And I think someone finally got tired of me making tacky jokes about how it um, how it holds a, a very whip-like structure. Um, <laughs> so then I think they changed the name, but don't worry, I'm not deterred. Um, so the MS and the C ring kind of inserting into what membrane there? Cytoplasmic or inner membrane. Excellent job, cool, cool. So these are all the components of a flagellum, and whomever is thinking about taking Norbert home and totally revamping Norbert with a little bit of a crafty tool work, um, we'll think about trying to add all of these structures onto the flagellum and make it really obvious um, how all of these work together. Now, what I think um, is probably going on in some of your minds is to think, well, how does the PMF make this rotate? So in fact, when the PMF is all um, pent up, right, so right in this space, you've got a ton of protons all accumulating forming that PMF, and I've got lousy grade school and writing here, but you get the point that there's a ton of protons there. There are two little, um, well, not, not terribly little, but there are two um, membrane proteins that um, are called MA A and MA B, and they actually provide this region where the protons can swoosh in. I don't want you to worry about the details there, but assume that they provide a place for the protons to swoosh in. And when the protons swoosh in, that causes either what? Clockwise or counterclockwise, depends on how you're looking at me, clockwise or counterclockwise motion. And that's what dictates what the bacterium does, is that PMF swooshing in and making it rotate. Does all of that make sense? Okay, marvelous. So let's talk a little bit more about flagella, flagellar distribution and ah, ooh, ah. and make sure that we understand the ways in which flagella can be found on the surface of a cell. This is my stuffed microbe. His name is Helicobacter pylori. What is he associated with? 
Peptic ulcers, right, good. Now remember that that, according to our guest lecture, was complicated because remember Christopher said that at high concentrations, this is associated with peptic ulcers, but at low concentrations and balanced concentrations, it can be associated with good health. But if we look at Helicobacter, you'll notice that it has a tuft of flagella, um, artistically shown as what looks like hair um, <laughs> on this guy. But in fact, we would actually term this Lophotrichus flagella, meaning that there's a tuft of flagella at one end of the cell. Now, I'm going to pass this guy around, and you can take a quick look. The last time I did that, it got a gangsta headband. Um, it's missing its gangsta headband right now. Um, so I I'll just leave that out there for you to play with. Um, so, distribution, we can have monotrichous flagella, one at, a, at the end of a pole. Now, it will turn out that although he doesn't know it, Dylan and Daniel and Nathan all have a monotrichous bacterium. So, your unknown was uh, a single polar flagellum at one end of the cell. Um, this is then, of course, a flagellum that can move either clockwise or counterclockwise, and that will dictate how it moves. Amphitrichus, as you might guess, amphi meaning what? Dual. So it means that there's one flagellum at one side and one from the other side, right? One on either side. Our, our uh, helicobacter coming around to you right now is Lophotrichus, having a tuft of flagella on, on one end of the cell. And then finally, when Enterobacteriaceae, like E. coli, are motile, they have peritrichus flagella. And in two dimensions, that's hard to show. But what that means is that they would have flagella covering the entire surface of the cell. Boris. Yeah, so that's a great question, right? Are flagella rigid or flaccid when they're not in motion? Let's think that through. What part of the flagellum would you think would always just stay rigid? The basal body and the hook. The basal body and the hook, but the filament, the filament is very flexible. Well, that, that protein is very flexible, very almost hair-like in nature. So what moves it and gets it going in a uniform direction is when the hook rotates. So when the hook rotates, that causes this uniform movement of the flagellum. Now, what are the two possible things that the bacterium could do when the um, flagellum rotates either clockwise or counterclockwise? Who's got an answer to that? What are the two things it could do? It can either run or it can tumble. That's all it can do. And it doesn't have that, um, sorry, this is entire surface. It doesn't have that flexibility to use the spatial sensing. I was thinking this is more the kind of uh, movement that we end up seeing from a bacterium is a little bit more like how Candace and Mandy run on the soccer field. Because, of course, you're avoiding people and you're carrying the ball. You're going to have to move around. You're going to stop. You're going to tumble. And then you're going to go run, right? And then you're going to stop and you're going to tumble and run. And, and that's going to be more like the kind of motion that we're going to expect for these bacteria. So when the flagella moves in a counterclockwise direction, it runs. When it moves in a clockwise direction, it tumbles. And these are the two motions we would see. Direction change, right? Avoiding, uh, a, you know, a defense man. Oh, no, you're carrying the ball. Uh, that's a tumble, right? You're moving, turning directions. And then a run would be a straight on motion, Heron. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's such a great question. Um, there are bacteria that do respond to the magnetic pole, but not via the flagellar difference in rotation. So it's a great, I love that. The magnetosomes would change whether it north orients or south orients based on pole. It's a cool question. So what drives that? Okay, so this is not unlike, Aaron, um, maybe, maybe ice cream is not your favorite treat. I mean, if it were me, it would be more like, okay, got to get that, you know, coconut milk latte. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going for that. Hemoattractant, same thing that motivates a bacterium. There's some sort of food source that's going to motivate it to move in the direction of that food source. Or what, what could be the opposite, opposite thing that could make it move? Chemicals they don't like, right, okay, exactly. Something they want to run away from, a toxic byproduct 
So they'll move either in response to a chemical attractant or away from a chemical repellent, a toxin. And they do this via temporal sensing. We know that that um, is what triggers the proton gradient to move inwards and cause the rotation. And there's a complex cascade of methylation and phosphorylation events that trigger whether or not the rotation is clockwise or counterclockwise. And of course, that is in response to these chemical attractants and repellents. So what do we call it when something moves, movement, in response to chemicals? Chemotaxis, right? Movement in response to chemicals. Chemotaxis, that's what's going on. Um, when chemoreceptors are bound, chemotaxis takes place. And of course, the chemoattractants and repellents control the movement of the flagella. If there is no attractant or repellent, then the bacterium moves randomly. It has equal runs and tumbles, right? random movement. It always keeps moving because it has to, right? Because it really has to keep moving because it uses temporal sensing. It can't just use, it can't hang out in one space and hope to use spatial sensing. It's got to keep on the run. But its movement is random in the absence of a chemical attractant or repellent. Now, add a chemical attraction, for example, put some glucose into the media, and then it's going to elongate what? The length of what will increase, or it'll start doing more runs, right? So it can get somewhere and less tumbles. And then we'll get that biased random walk to the chemo attractant or away from the chemo repellent. We start to get this movement. So then the question arises, and you might be thinking this, in the presence of both a chemoattractant and a chemorepellent, anybody want to give, give a guess to what the bacterium will respond to more avidly? The attraction, right? I know I was thinking this morning, this is like Colin and his beer, right? He knows there's maybe some repellents in his beer. That is, if he drinks enough of it, there's some toxic products in there that are going to cause some toxic effects. But usually the attractants are a little more appealing than the repellents, right? Um, and I thought that oh, was such a great idea. Um, but so bacteria respond to attractants at a concentration as low as 10 to the minus 8 molar. Right, really, really tiny concentrations of attractant, whereas repellents have to be at much higher concentration uh, in order to cause them to respond. And we can see why that would be. So the last thing that will be on the exam um, is just um, probably not much of a question at all on P. Lyer fimbriae. But do you notice that um, good old Norbert has some structures still left on it? If you're looking from the side there, you can see there look like these little plastic hairs on Norbert. Um, those are pili or fimbriae. Now, your book differentiates the two terms. It calls fimbriae these little hair-like protrusions, much smaller, much, much smaller than flagella, that are often just involved in kind of um, moving things across the surface of the cell or causing kind of weird, short, quivering, twitching motion. Um, or lastly, what is, what is the maybe most famous role of a P-less? Sex P-less, yeah, right. The conjugal transfer of genetic material. This is why your book actually distinguishes. It only call, calls things P-li if they're sex P-li and calls everything else fimbriae, like things that are involved in motion and whatnot. So... Shorter and thinner than flagella, though in ultra structure, they also are hollow cord structures. They allow for adherence to specific surfaces. And in fact, this is one of the things that makes fimbriae very famous. Because bacteria with fimbriae sometimes have little adhesin proteins on the surface of them that allow them to bind to glycoproteins in a host. For example, E. coli, when it causes urinary tract infections, has little adhesins on the pili that bind to glycoproteins that, um, that keep it from being voided with the urine. It's like it just holds on, right? 
And that's one of the famous roles that um, Fimbriae can play. They can also, as I said, assist in these sort of short, quivering motions of population cells across, of a population of cells across a medium. And I thought um, that the Jessicas, both the Jessicas would be interested to know um, that they actually, mixobacterium moves like this, where you can put a population of cells onto a solid plate medium, and it'll move by these like kind of short quivering motions. And uh, they actually call that a wolf pack, literally call it a wolf pack. And you can see why, because it's a whole population moving together across a solid medium. So wolf pack movement. <laughs> and then lastly, of course, sex pili are an example of pili. This ends the coverage that you might see on the exam. Um, are there any like thought provoking things that hit you, Bailey, any um, you know, eureka moments in your looking up that question? Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, both, yeah, and an Esler. Okay, yeah, good. So, that, so we were kind of right in, in predicting that. Okay, we're not going to stop quite yet, but I, I think it's cool to pause. Um, and certainly, as we begin our coverage of the eukaryotic cell, um, it's cool to think about diversity in the eukaryotic world. Um, because we can think about our cheek cell, and there's actually a picture up there. Who saw a cheek cell when they did their teeth scraping? <laughs> yeah, occasionally we get a cheek cell on the slide. So obviously that's a eukaryotic cell. In, in a multicellular organism like us, it's really super highly differentiated. It has one job, right? It is just cheek cell. That's all it does. We can contrast that with something like this lower, lower right, um, this is a yeast cell here, and you can kind of recognize that a yeast cell has a cell wall, but what do we know is definitely going to be true of that cell wall? What will it not contain? Right, peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan is only found where? Bacteria. Not in any other domain of life, okay? So we've been pondering the applications of that, haven't we? So now, lower left, who saw something that looked like this on the very first day of lab when you looked at the Winograd ski column sludge? You might have found something cool like this. These are diatoms, and they have a cell wall too. We know, of course, it's not peptidoglycan, but guess what? It's actually silicon. So what else do you know in the world that's made out of silicon? Silicon compounds like silicon dioxide. Glass, right? Glass. So these cell walls are like glass, and they literally look like glass figurines. And in fact, um, these, when they die, and they accumulate on the sea floor, which I just wrote a question about Kayla and her passion for marine biology, they accumulate on the sea floor, and it's like a bunch of broken glass on the sea floor. And it makes something you might have heard of called diatomaceous earth. What kinds of things is that found in? Think about it. Yeah, where do you find diatomaceous earth? Like you go to Lowe's and you're shopping. In what products would you find? Garden part. It, in fact, it's often used as an insect killer because it'll cut holes in the exoskeleton of insects. So it's actually uh, an insect killer. Um, it's also found in polishes, abrasives, uh, toothpaste. Right, anything that would need like a fine abrasion, you know, that would make a lot of sense. So it has a lot of uses, but it's not peptidoglycan, of course. This is considered an algal cell. So whereas we have yeast here, um, these are algae. This is called a protease, but you might recognize it specifically as paramecium. And unlike the cheek cell, of course, a paramecium cell is single standing. It has to do all of its work alone which means that it actually has to seek and ingest food on its own. So a very different kind of eukaryotic cell than the cheek cell. So the world of eukaryote is very, very diverse, but we could split it up in the microbial aspects of that world. And we're going to be talking about those components, fungi, protease, and the proteins encompass the algae and protozoa. Now here's what's really weird though is that phylogenetically, algae and protozoa don't actually sit in unique categories. That is, if you were to take the DNA 
of an algal cell and compare it to other algal cells, you might find that, in fact, it's less related to those other algae than it is to a paramecium, a protease. So it's weird to think about the fact that although all algae are unified by what they do, what do they do, algae? Why do we call them that? Photosynthesis, they're unified by what they do, but they don't actually have the same kind of DNA sequences that, that, you know, across the board that would unify them. So, in fact, they're only unified by the way that they live, by photosynthesis and by being photoautotrophs. And some of them are more closely related to protozoa than they are to other algae. So these are the categories here. Now, let's make sure we situate this into the larger domains of life. So every time it seems like I... So we can remember that the three domains of life were what? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So domains. Bacteria. So guaranteed on the exam, there will be some questions that ask you to think about the differences, right? This is the only domain of life that has peptidoglycan, right? And what is true of archaea and bacteria that is not true of eukarya? Okay, good. Okay, those are things that I want to think about, the lack of a true membrane-bound nucleus. What does a prokaryotic cell have instead? Nucleoid, which is a gel-like mass. Where we find that, I remember Norbert's nucleoid there is shown in red, it's a gel-like mass. But what is another difference that we said is very, very important in medicine? Yeah, good. The 70S versus 80S ribosomes. So whereas we see 70S ribosomes in both bacteria and archaea, we see 80S ribosomes in eukarya. Except for, interestingly, in what unique spot do we see some 70S ribosomes? Some of you thought about this with me. Yeah, mitochondria. Super perplexing to think about that, that mitochondria. So that's just planting a seed for further discussion. Okay. So online today, I posted a um, picture of a eukaryotic cell. And on Wednesday, we're going to attempt to do a little bit of game playing with that picture. So do try to bring a form of it that would be amenable to either drawing on it or maybe modifying it on your iPad or something like that. Okay, I'll see you all tomorrow. Recently, and I'm a little bit concerned about the exam. Like, I was wondering if you get 30 points towards your lowest exam score. Is that the equivalent of 30 percent? Yeah, but if you're sick, just let me know, um, and uh, we will we will uh, schedule you to take the exam on Thursday morning or something. Okay. Yeah, I'd rather that than taking it really sick. Okay. Yeah. I don't really like you to come sick. Um, so I just purchased last the book, the Ball Air Gut Book. So mm -hmm. my son, I want to post a few questions. Yeah. And, you just on and in fact, by the end of the week, just get in there and get active and you'll be fine. Okay, great. Yep. Thanks. I was just wondering, what room is the review from 330 to 14? Um, it's upstairs in the next door to the lab. Okay. Yeah. I can't make the producer. Could I possibly bring the model at some yeah, any time is fine. Yeah, oh, yeah, it doesn't matter. I didn't want to like or tomorrow meeting. or whatever. Okay, you yeah, know, I got it. Um, I yeah. It. Oh, yeah. Because I've got. I'm teaching this afternoon. Very soon, so, uh, you, you may even just want to bring it tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. What time? Best for you. Well, tomorrow we're in lab all day. You know, I'm. I'm oh, yeah. on there seven thirty to nine thirty. Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Hola. <laughs> Hey, uh, I had one question when the um, when and where the exam review will be today. I so we're upstairs uh, next door to the lab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah just where we usually have it. So. Okay. What time? Three thirty, four thirty is that okay. is the early one, and then seven thirty to three online. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And then uh, 
I was looking through these and I wasn't sure like when it said the amino acids, what like the L and D stood yeah, for. Yeah, so L and D just stand for the um, particular stereoisomer. So okay. um, the, the important thing to understand about that is that most amino acids are L and D is something you don't typically see. In, okay. in, you don't see D in proteins, so it's understanding that those are weird, weird, mm -hmm. weird. Okay, so that's okay, all. Yeah, that thank you. So the book differentiates between our fembrier and the mm -hmm. It does. Do, yeah. we, do we need to differentiate that, or if we um, if we yeah, see the hair-like I mean, protrusions? So what, kind of what I wanted you to know is that terminology will be dependent upon the person using it. So some people say pili and broadly mean everything. Okay. Our book says sex pili are the only thing they call pili and they call everything else fimbriate. Okay. So it's just a matter of knowing that like if you're talking to some professor who calls what you've called fimbriate calls them pili, that's not out of the ordinary, right? That okay. could be a thing. Okay, that's um, what I was So, I mean, but if you're asking what would you answer on an exam if, if I asked you, I, well, I mean, I try not to, to I mean, I, I try to say, you know, is this, or a fimbri, you know, but um, but you can use your book's definition for purposes of of you know any exam question that you might. Okay. See. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. As promised, last bottle. <gasps> Thank you so much. You are amazing. <laughs> um, so tomorrow I've got like exactly a two-hour period that okay. I can take the lab, yep, yep. and that is it. Yep. If, I, if that's not going to be enough time for me, should I just reschedule? Yeah, I love the turtle. Um, oh, thanks. You know, I think what you should do is come in, and um, you'll probably be totally fine, right? But if you're for some reason stressing, and you're like, I'm not going to be fine, we'll just uh, work it out for you to swing back by and finish it. I just need to make sure that we specially work that out, because I get so stressed about losing your exam. If you, like, say, hand it to some TA and say, I'm coming back, and then you come back, and it's like, where did that go? You know, it. It, it stresses me out. Okay. So if you do decide that that's just not going to work and you're going to have to come back tomorrow morning and finish it, I need to know that. You need to hunt me down. We need to make sure it's put somewhere safe and that we've made a deal with how we're going to do that. But I don't want you to feel incredibly stressed in your two-hour block. Okay. So it should yeah, be fine. I was thinking two hours probably be enough. Oh, yeah. If it, it wasn't, I just wanted to make sure. It should totally like, be fine. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Thanks. Yeah.